All right, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 8. Matthew 8. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. If you open your Bibles to the middle and hang a right, Matthew's about halfway between the middle and the end. Last week, we started a new four-part series in Matthew's gospel entitled Powerful Redeemer. And a big thank you to Tom Burke for launching us out into that series, revealing Jesus as the king over disease, the one who redeems illness, sickness, even death, partially now in this life, revealing that the kingdom of God has really come into this world. And as a foretaste of what will be fully when Jesus comes again and ushers in the new heavens and the new earth, when there will be no more sickness, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. This new four-part series in Matthew's gospel through chapters eight and nine connect us all the way back to the beginning of Genesis, which if you've been a part of this series in Matthew since November, You've heard me refer back to Genesis many times, which makes sense when we remember that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is not something God just cooked up after everything else had failed in the first century. Rather, it was a promise, a plan from the very beginning that we see worked out and developed throughout the Old Testament, leading to the birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is the gospel promised, and the New Testament is the gospel realized. And Matthew is very intentional throughout his gospel to show us that the kingdom of God, which Jesus has brought into this world, is all about reclaiming, restoring, and redeeming that which was broken, shattered, and destroyed in the garden in the beginning when Adam and Eve fell into sin. Remember that in the garden, because of the fall, we see four relationships that get shattered. First and foremost, humanity's relationship to God, to our creator. But because of that, so too our relationship with ourself, our relationship with one another, and our relationship to the world around us. And it turns out that Jesus liked his creation so much when he made it in Genesis 1 and 2 that he wants all of it back. And so last week's text revealed Jesus as the powerful redeemer over disease, pushing back on the effects of the fall and sin against our bodies. And this week's text is going to reveal Jesus as the powerful redeemer over creation, pushing back on the effects of the fall and sin against our relationship with the natural world around us. And so now as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God, for what scripture says, God says. If you're able, wherever you're at this morning, I want to invite you to rise with me as we listen to the voice of our God from his word, Matthew 8, verses 23 to 27. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. This is God's holy and sufficient word for you. Let's pray. Father, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God, it stands forever. And so would you speak to our hearts by that word today? We pray in Christ's name and for his sake, and together we say, amen. Please be seated. Think back to when you were a young child. What were some of the things that brought fear into your soul? Maybe it was that moment that mom left your bedroom for the night and turned off the light. Or the moment that you realized that you're in your room alone and the closet door is still open. Maybe it was when you had to go into that dark and cold basement to get a toy only to turn around and run back up those stairs as fast as you could. Maybe it was that clown because 
Well, it was a clown. <laughs> All of these situations cause young children to ask for a nightlight or for their parents to go down to the basement with them out of fear that harm may come their way. Good thing we grow out of this as adults. Or do we? You may no longer ask for a nightlight, but what keeps you awake at night? Maybe it's that test you have to take tomorrow morning at school that's going to determine your GPA and whether you get into that school or get that scholarship. Maybe it's that relationship that you're in that you deep down know you need to get out of. Maybe it's that child's choices and behaviors that cause you to worry about their faith and their future. Maybe it's your job that's currently on hold and you're not certain it will be there when the economy starts back up again. Maybe it's that stock portfolio that's dropped 30% over the last month as you are itch, inching closer to retirement. Maybe it's your loved one who's currently in the hospital suffering from the symptoms of COVID-19. Unfortunately, there is no guarantee that the older we get, the less we will be stricken with fear. We may no longer need a nightlight but our souls long to be comforted. Our text today speaks loudly and clearly to our problem of fear. The disciples found themselves in a boat with Jesus at the end of an incredibly long day. As Tom had mentioned last week, it's likely that, that our text comes at the conclusion of a day that began with Jesus preaching the entire Sermon on the Mount, then going and healing Miraculously, many people in and around the, the city of Capernaum, which was his home base, his hometown for his three years of ministry. And then because Jesus was exhausted at the end of the day, he desired to escape the crowds. And so he and his disciples get into a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. But little did the disciples know that though the day was coming to an end, God was far from working on their hearts, far from done. And what would happen next would bring incredible exposure, exposure both of their own hearts, but even more so, it would expose the identity of the one who slept in that boat as the storms began to roar. And so this morning, what we want to see in our text is that because Jesus is king over the entire natural world, we are called to be a people marked by faith rather than fear. The scene described for us in these five verses reveals a great and mighty storm. And what this storm is intended to reveal to us today is three things. Number one the effects of the fall on creation. Number two, the condition of the disciples and therefore our faith. And number three, the king over creation who is worthy of your complete trust. And so first, let's consider the effects of the fall on creation. I said this earlier and I've said this many times since November that the fourth relationship that was shattered back in the Garden of Eden was humanity's relationship with the natural world, with creation. If we go back to Genesis 3 and, and Adam and Eve's rebellion against the good commands of God for them, we see that the effects, the consequence of that rebellion is that God speaks two curses. The first curse is against Satan when he says in verse 14, because you have done this, cursed are you, Satan, above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. And then this is followed up with that gospel promise in verse 15 that says that the seed of the woman would eventually crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And so for Satan, he is cursed unto destruction. But the second curse that God speaks is actually against the creation. It's against the earth. It's against the ground. Listen to verse 17. And to Adam, he said, 
because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. See, the relationship between humanity and the creation was intended to be a glorious one, a harmonious one, a blessed relationship whereby we had dominion over it, we, we cared for it, we stewarded its resources, and from it we gathered that which we needed for life and for human flourishing. And yet, because of our sin against a holy God who had given us everything that we needed for life and human flourishing, we now see that the relationship between the creation and humanity would be a tumultuous one. Work would be hard. Resources would be scarce. Businesses and industries would fail. Economies would collapse. Homelessness and poverty would occur. Storms would rise. Earthquakes would destroy. Tsunamis would bring great destruction. The relationship between humanity and the creation would no longer be simply a harmonious one, but one that would make life hard, one that would leave us longing for restoration and for redemption. And the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans confirms this reality of the creation when he says this in chapter 8. He says, For the creation waits with eager longing, for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. As the kingdom of God has come into this world with Jesus Christ, there is hope for the creation that kingdom citizens, that disciples will care for it, will steward it well, will bring order to and human flourishing out of the creation. And yet, because the kingdom of God is already here, but not yet fully here, we see the final solution not revealed until Revelation 21, namely a new heavens and a new earth. One that is no longer under a curse, but one that has been set free from corruption and is once again functioning as the creator intended. Now all that to say that this storm the disciples encounter on the Sea of Galilee in Matthew chapter 8 is further evidence of the effects of the fall on creation. The lives of these 12 men were under serious threat. Verse 24 says this, And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. Now keep in mind that several of these men were fishermen. Peter, Andrew, James, John, they are well familiar with the Sea of Galilee. They are well familiar with fishing boats. This is their comfort zone. And yet their response speaks to the magnitude of this storm as these fishermen rush to wake up a Jewish carpenter and cry out, Lord, save us. We are perishing. The reality is that humanity's relationship to the creation is one that throughout human history has posed threats both to us and threats and abuses to the creation itself by us. And even though in the West and in the U.S. specifically, we have so much wealth and we have so many resources that it can mask our frailties and our vulnerabilities yet today in the year 2020 in an extremely advanced society, we stand in the midst of a great storm, almost crippled and on our knees, reminded that this world in its totality 
needs to be redeemed. This massive storm on the Sea of Galilee reminds us of the effects of the fall on creation, but it also served this day to expose the condition of the disciples' faith. And so, second this morning, let's consider how this storm that the disciples were in brought the underlying realities up to the surface and revealed the true condition of their faith. The disciples' cry in the midst of the storm revealed that their hearts were a mixture of both faith and fear, right? Their cry, save us, Lord, we are perishing, is on the one hand to say, Jesus, we believe you can do something about this, which makes sense as earlier in the day they had witnessed him miraculously heal multiple people. But clearly, the panic in their response reveals that their fears were much greater than their faith. And Jesus confirms this by his response. He says, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Did they possess faith? Yes, they did. But Jesus makes clear that their faith was lacking. It was too small. And that reality is seen in the fact that they are overcome with fear. See, we will either be a people whose faith chases out our fears, or we will be a people whose fears chase out our faith. And we won't really know which one we are until we find ourselves in the midst of a great storm a storm that threatens that which we hold dear. Now, before Jesus addresses or deals with the storm, he asks them a question. He says, why are you afraid? That's a simple but profound question for them and for us to answer. What drives your fears? Jesus gives the disciples a moment, albeit it's a brief moment, to, for introspection. Why are you afraid and are you right to be so panicked? I think for many of us, if we dig down deep enough to expose the roots of our fears, we would see that oftentimes that lies in us coming to understand that situations are much more out of our control than we thought they were. It's hard to imagine a situation much more out of control than being in a first century fishing boat. This is what that might look like. Hopefully you can see this okay on the screen. But this is a replica of a first century fishing boat that they actually found along the, sh the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's not so small, but it's not so big either. And so they find themselves in the middle of this massive body of water in a first century fishing boat with the winds howling and the waves crashing over their boat, tossing it to and fro, threatening their life. There was nothing that they could do and they knew it. And that caused the panic to begin to rise. But that's also where Jesus brings his critique. See, in that moment that you realize that life is much more out of your control than you thought it was, will we be a people who respond with faith or with fear? That's a test that as Jesus' disciples, we are going to face countless times throughout our life. I love the way that Matthew Henry, in his commentary on this passage, summarizes Jesus' words to his disciples. He says this, He, that is Jesus, he doesn't chide them for disturbing him with their prayers, but for disturbing themselves with their fears. Let me read that again. He doesn't chide them for disturbing him with their prayers, but for disturbing themselves with their fears. See, friends, the Christian life 
is to be one marked by faith. Of course, we think of that as it comes to our justification. Justification means having our sin forgiven and removed by the atoning death of Christ on the cross, but also having his righteousness credited to our account. That happens. We are justified by faith alone, apart from any works or obedience that we have to offer. We are to be a people marked by faith, but not only in the moment of our salvation, but throughout our life. As we come to realize and understand how much of our life is out of our control, but we believe that there is nothing, nothing out of control from the sovereign, good, and almighty God. Friends, I don't know when in the past three weeks it clicked for you, but I think for most of us, there was a moment when all of a sudden we realized, okay, we are in the middle of a great storm and that most of it is out of our control. Here's what you can do. Sit at home. Sit at home. Maybe for you, that moment happened when you You heard your kids were going to be kept at home and overnight you were turned into a homeschool parent with no preparation and no training. Maybe that moment was Thursday when you heard that that was now the permanent solution for the rest of this school year. Maybe for you it was that moment you got the email from your boss telling you to stay home from work and that at some point that paycheck might get cut or stopped altogether. Maybe it was that moment that you got the phone call that your loved one or your friend was in the hospital with symptoms of COVID-19. Maybe it was that moment that we sent out the email indicating that all of our public worship services were suspended indefinitely. Lots of situations to become frustrated about and overcome with fear. And if the last month has taught us anything, It's that life is much more out of our control than we ever thought it was. And now we stand at a moment as disciples to be tested. Does our faith chase out our fear? Or do our fears chase out our faith? Finally, this morning... We end with the main point of this entire passage. It's the foundation. It's what enables you to pass that test I just mentioned. And in this sermon, we've truly saved the best for last. As we now see Jesus revealed as the king over creation, over nature, the entire natural world, proving himself to be worthy of your complete faith and trust. Remember that one of Matthew's main purposes in writing his gospel was to prove to his predominantly Jewish audience that Jesus was the Messiah who had been foretold for thousands of years throughout the Old Testament. And Matthew is dropping hints and clues and narratives and and discourse within his gospel to show us that not only would this Messiah be a king who would usher in his kingdom, but that he would be a divine king from whom his kingdom would be called the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. See, the Jewish people expected there to be this messianic figure who would win victory on their behalf. What they did not expect was that this Messiah would also be God himself. Hence the chance, crucify, crucify. And yet our text today reveals Jesus to be exactly that. But first, let's also notice that this passage reveals Jesus to be truly human. For after a long day of work and ministry, he's tired. He's exhausted. How tired? He passes out in a fishing boat in the middle of a massive storm. Now, I could sleep through my infant child screaming at night, but I don't think even I could sleep through that. And yet Matthew, after creating this scene for us of this massive storm threatening their lives, just kind of -of matter-of-factly states But he, that is Jesus, was asleep. 
It's subtle, but what Matthew's doing here is he's creating this tremendous contrast between the disciples who are panicked and overcome with fear and Jesus who peacefully sleeps in the midst of a storm. The disciples understood that the situation was completely out of their control. But even as Jesus slept, he knew how his life was going to end and this was not it. And so he awakes and after addressing the disciples' lack of faith, he rises with his word, rebukes the wind and the sea. And Matthew tells us that immediately everything became calm. It's stunning. And it leaves the disciples with only one question to ask in verse 27. What sort of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? Now, Matthew doesn't answer that question. He just kind of leaves it out there, waiting for it to be answered by the reader. But Matthew knew how his Jewish readers would answer that question because Matthew knew that his Jewish readers knew Psalm 107, which in verse, 20, verse 28 says this. Then they cried to the Lord, to God, to Yahweh, in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. See, any Jew familiar with the Old Testament knew that the only one who controlled nature was God himself. What sort of man is this? who heals disease, who casts out demons, who stills the storm by his word. He is the king, the divine king, God in the flesh, who controls nature by the power of his word. Friends, when I look into my life and I look into the world around me, I am deeply aware of all of the things that are outside of my control. And I am tempted in those moments to be stricken with fear. But in those moments, as disciples, as citizens of the kingdom of God, we are invited, indeed called, to fix our eyes upon the king, the divine king, the one who has the power to still any storm by the mere command of his voice. No waves rise without his permission and no storms fall outside of his sovereign care. And though he has the power to still every storm, including the one we are in right now, he doesn't calm every storm, not immediately. And so our faith, yes, is in the power of God to accomplish every thing he desires to, but our faith is also in the goodness of God, such that if God chooses to withhold his power to still that storm, we can believe he is with us in the midst of it and that from it, he will work good for us. And here is that promise in Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things, the storm God miraculously stills and the storms that seem to last forever, all things, all things work together for good for those who love God. And the king over creation has the power to ensure that they will. And so may we be a people 
whose faith in that king, the divine king, chase out the fears of our life. May we be a people whose anthem is Psalm 56. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh or any storm do to me? Let's pray. Father, our lives are often, like the disciples, a mixture of faith and fear. Here we stand, Lord, in the midst of a great storm with our faith being tested. May we fix our eyes on you, the king over creation, the powerful redeemer, and our good and gracious father. Increase our faith. We pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.